Welcome to All Space Considered, everyone. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and with me tonight is Patrick So, Chris Butler, and also our special guest, Ken Carpenter. Dr. Ken Carpenter is here with us tonight. We're very excited to talk to Ken. Um, and with us, as always, will be uh, Katie as well. And we're lucky to have Jared back to talk to us about out to launch and all the rocket launches that are happening. But let's take a look at our... Uh, Why am I a little confused about things? Anyway, let me move forward into, uh, into our first video of the night. Well, hi folks, I can explain what went on there just a little bit. We actually have a second video that was really supposed to be a different first video, but whatever, the intro was so great, we thought we'd show it to you twice. Um, the idea was that we've been creating these uh, introductory videos and that they're kind of so great. We thought that they should start at the start of the show at 7.30 rather than at 7.28 or 7.27. So we created a second more generic, although it's also pretty great um, introduction that we could start to test the stream. That was the original idea behind these videos, that we would simply have some audio, we'd have some video, we'd have something to look at, and we'd let you know the show's going to start pretty soon. But um, Bill and, and uh, Hannah, who create these, are doing such a fantastic job. We thought we should really start these at the official start of the show. And today, um, things got mi mixed up a little bit. We put the same video in the same spot. So you'll just have to wait till next month to see our, our new first introductory video, but that's what went on there. So anyway, let's tell you what's on the show tonight. Like I said, we're very lucky to have Dr. Ken Carpenter talking to us about JWST commissioning the telescope for science operation and a look at the recently rela released first light images. So um, Ken's at the Goddard Space Flight Center and um, well, he has just a wee bit of experience with these space telescopes. So we're thrilled to have you here tonight with us, Ken. Um, after that, we are going to do an in memoriam for Michelle Nichols, of course, who played Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. And uh, we really wanted to thank her for everything she's done. And uh, you'll, you'll get to have that a little bit. And then we'll turn to Katie, where she's going to show us more of the beautiful pictures taken by um, amateur astronomers, taken by photographers across the, the globe. And 
even some of her own pictures tonight that you're going to get to see. And then she'll also talk about some space weather that's been going on, which is always a lot of fun to see. Then we'll do our sky report with Patrick So if he can tell us what we should be looking at this month and keep our eyes up in the, up to the sky. Um, we're going to do a Mars update, myself and Chris. Uh, Chris, even though you're not doing out to launch tonight, he's going to be telling us about ingenuity and insight, two of the spacecraft, two of the ro robots that are on Mars. And I'll be talking about curiosity and perseverance, and we'll, we'll give you kind of a ground report. Um, although we're even going to mention the, the Chinese rover, not mention it is pretty much all that we can do. Um, then we're going to turn to out to launch, and we've got Jared. Jared Head is back with us. He's one of our fantastic museum guides at Griffith Observatory, and also very knowledgeable about launches and spacecraft, and it's always fun to hear from him. Um, to, to, to just to talk launches. So we figured we'd bring him back and we'd turn Chris loose on some different material. And then lastly, JWST, just wow. And we're gonna talk about some of the social impact that's happened and show a few more images from, from the JWST, the Just Wow Space Telescope. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. So Ken, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're gonna start off with the, the, the most exciting part of the show. Um, so welcome back to All Space Considered. I know you've, you've spoke at Griffith Observatory a few times. You were here for the, the Hubble 25th anniversary. It's, that's a crazy number, but we, we had a big party essentially up at Griffith Observatory for three or four days. I think it was four and you joined us and then talked Hubble. And I know you've dropped by All Space a couple of more times, once or twice. So welcome back. And it's a thrill to have you here tonight to tell us about what's been going on with JWSD. Oh, thank you, uh, David, for the warm welcome. It's great to be back if in a virtual sense tonight. <laughs> um, and welcome to everybody who's joining us here tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, well, first of all, I'm the operations project scientist on the Hubble Space Telescope and the uh, ground system scientist on the Romans um, Space Telescope. Uh, I don't work directly on web, but of course I'm surrounded by folks uh, that do, and I've been uh, talking to them and hopefully have the inside scoop for you uh, as we go through here. So uh, let's move on. I do want to start by saying, pointing out, which probably uh, something a lot of you already realize, is that JWST is not really a replacement for Hubble, but rather a successor to it. And that's because uh, Webb will primarily look at the universe in the infrared, the red red part of the visible spectrum and the infrared redder than the ICs and redder than in most cases gets through the Earth's atmosphere. While Hubble actually looks at the blue part, uh, the visible and the blue and out into the ultraviolet, which is uh, bluer than the ICs. So they're looking at different parts of the spectrum, different colors, and therefore they're gonna get different information on the objects they're looking at. Um, Webb's uh, larger light collecting area, a couple of the improved infrared sensitivity or the infrared coverage that it has will allow it to peer back further into time than HST and is actually one of its prime driving goals to get back to try to see the first galaxies, the first stars when they first turn on after what's called the dark ages, uh, a couple start, which started a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. JWST sees cooler material and peers through and into the interior of dust clouds because the infrared light with its longer wavelengths can actually wiggle around dust particles more easily and, and allow us to do that. Uh, HST sees hotter material and can see the exterior details of these same clouds. So that's just some of the differences that one can see using uh, observing at the different colors that the two telescopes I'll look at, but there's a lot more. So they're very complementary to each other and together they will extend the science that we can do tremendously. Hubble has been, uh, we have been waiting for, for Webb to launch for quite some time now as uh, our own telescope age, we wanted to be able to use the two telescopes together. And we were very happy to see it launch last December and to get into this mode where we can work side by side. I'll just do a few introductory um, comments on JWST to put it in context. It's a very large uh, telescope, especially the um, sun shield. Let's see if I can get the laser pointer to work here. Yeah, see here this white extended area here is a sun shield about the size of a tennis court. Uh, it's actually a five layer mylar foil material. 
and that's designed to keep the upper part of the telescope cool. We'll talk more about that in a second. It's also located at a different spot in orbit than Hubble is. Hubble is in low Earth orbit, only 340 miles up. That was in part so the space shuttle could get there and service it as it did uh, five times over the uh, early years of Hubble. Uh, that's of course no longer happening because the shuttle is no longer flying. Um, but that's one reason it was down in low Earth orbit. JWST, on the other hand, is going to be out at what's called the Lagrange 2.L2, which you see here. Um, and that uh, point is located on a line from the sun, draw it through the earth and go another million miles out. And that is the L2 point. Webb is orbiting slowly around that L2 point, as a lot of other um, telescopes uh, are doing and will do in the future. That gets it further away from the heat contamination uh, of the Earth and the Moon, that objects that observatories in low Earth orbit uh, will run into. Uh, more visualization here of the distance. Here you see Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, only 93 million miles there. Uh, and then if you look at uh, JWST out here at one end, uh, about a million miles further out uh, from the Earth. As an illustration of the wavelength coverage, the difference in wavelength coverage, the different colors it looks at, you see here um, on the left, the blue box shows the wavelengths ultraviolet and visible, mostly that Hubble covers. Webb has a tiny overlap in the red part of the visible spectrum and then goes off further into the infrared substantially uh, than HST. And as you see on, on the same chart, other observatories are listed. WMAP goes off into the microwave, the VLA and the radio, uh, RXTE and SWIFT down in the X-ray and gamma rays. So we have a whole fleet of telescopes up there. Uh, these are two of the biggest, uh, HST and JWST. Um, yeah, but they are working together with this larger fleet as well. To set the uh, stage for what we're trying to do with JWST, one of the deeper, uh, what we, we see here is look back time going back toward the Big Bang on the right part of the screen here. The HST Goods and Chandra Deep Field combined, where we took data from both telescopes and combined it, got back to something like a billion years here after the Big Bang. We've gone a little bit deeper further back in time with very specialized observations using gravitational lenses, for instance, in the, in the sky. Um, but for the most part, that defines the edge of what uh, HSC can see. JWST is designed to go further back to within something like two to 300 million years after the Big Bang. And we hope in that, um, in that difference between where Hubble looked and, and where JWST is gonna be able to look, we will see both the first galaxies and earlier than that, the first stars to light up after the dark ages. So that's the holy grail that Webb is looking for. Uh, we hope, hopefully we'll find those events, the first stars and the first galaxies uh, within easily within the capabilities of JWST. And we'll see a spot where there aren't stars beyond that that uh, JWST would see uh, if they were there. That will inform our uh, theories of the origin and evolution of the universe and is a very important uh, item. Uh, JWST will do a lot of other science that we'll talk about, but that's kind of the holy grail. Let's find the first galaxies that turned on, the first stars that turned on. Looking at the structure of the telescope, uh, a little bit more here on the left side, you see uh, we're looking down on the top of the telescope where the optics are, the science instruments are behind the mirrors here between, behind the 18 segments. The secondary mirror is up to the right here. So light comes in from the target off on the right side, hits the primary mirror, the 18 mirror segments, goes to the secondary mirror up here, and then down through a hole in the center of the primary mirror to the science instruments. If you flip the telescope over, uh, you see here the sun facing side. Uh, this is where all the components that don't need to be cool uh, and can be in full sun air there. The solar arrays are obviously there. You've got steering and control jets down here, antenna communications to the earth and star trackers. 
but the whole point of the star shade is to keep the science instruments and the optics cool uh, because if we don't keep them cool they give out a lot of infrared uh, radiation which we would feel as heat and that would confuse and add a uh, noisy background to our observations. Now I wanted to mention this is uh, I called the talk commissioning JWSC and that's mostly in orbit but there's a lot of testing that goes on, on the ground before we get there so I just wanted to show you a few pictures from that. These are two pictures showing the prepping and testing of the mirrors uh, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center where I work. And you see on the left here uh, one of the final mirrors with the gold coating and a test mirror that's illuminized uh, like our normal mirrors are. We used gold on the web mirrors because that allows us, uh, that reflects infrared light at a much higher uh, efficiency. And we're trying to maximize the efficiency in the infrared. Uh, on the right, we see an experiment that was done to see if there was a way to safely clean the mirror if it were to get contaminated during integration and test on the ground. So this is a test mirror here, not one of the final ones. You can see it doesn't have the hexagonal shape that the final mirrors do. And what you see here is a technician using a carbon dioxide snow to blow off particulates, to blow off uh, molecules that uh, might be contaminating it. And it was designed to only be used if something got contaminated during the ground INT testing. Moving along to October of 2016, it's the first time that we had got, or got to see the entire mirror array put together. Um, it's behind this glass wall, which uh, is on the side of one of the largest clean rooms, at least in the eastern part of the US. Uh, this is a class 10,000 clean room, very high quality uh, air. There's filters along the right wall that you don't see in this picture that filter all of the air coming in and the air flows across in a laminar flat fashion very little disturbance, no turbulence or anything, keeps the air in there very clean. Uh, they put this, uh, both the mirrors and the instruments together uh, in this room, and they have this little mezzanine area where you can go in and look at it. And it was all, of course, very exciting to walk in there and see this massive mirror uh, standing up above you and made you feel that we were finally getting close to launch. This next one is a uh, kind of a cute picture. It shows, uh, the mirror head on and a very large group of people trying to get a look at uh, the mirror before it's shipped off to Johnson for further testing. So you see here, this uh, rectangular shape that you see is, is actually the window uh, reflected back, the other side of the window reflected back uh, toward us. And you see all the people standing in there looking out. I must be in there somewhere since I took this picture, but in this particular one, I haven't found it. I have one where it's, it's much more clear. Ground testing um, at Goddard continued with testing of the science instrument module. So we assembled the mirror array there, tested that, and then we um, put the science instrument module together with the various you know, instruments in it. This is on the left, is it in the clean room? And then it was transported and put down into this massive, what's called thermal vacuum tank. You drop this down gently into there, put a domed structure over it, and then you can pump all the air out, get to a, uh, a vacuum like that in space, and then you can also uh, lower the temperature or put the temperature through cycles like you would see in space, and you do this to make sure that everything's going to hang together, that everything functions in a vacuum, and that no wiring or other components pull apart when you um, actually go through the temperatures you expect to see in space. Then. Uh, the mirror and science instrument were shipped out to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, put together uh, with the rest of the facility and put into this even larger thermal vacuum tank, which is actually um, from the Apollo era. It was what was used for what was called human thermal vac. So the astronauts would go into this chamber and there would be uh, a simulated uh, lunar surface in there. They could go in, try using their tools, um, try uh, moving around and making sure that they uh, could practice their stuff in something that simulated um, the, the lunar environment. That uh, chamber was completely refurbished for a web and used to test uh, the whole thing coming together. You see uh, on the upper right here, a, um, uh, it exiting the chamber. Then it was moved on to Grumman in California 
and you see it in the clean room out there as they were testing the uh, deployment and tensioning of the um, sunshade. And then I also tested out there, uh, putting it together to fit into the Ariane rocket fairing and making sure it would uh, unfold from there okay. So they packaged it up there and then sent it down uh, to Crew in French Guinea for the launch that uh, we all saw on Christmas Day in 2021. Uh, just a beautiful sight after um, many years of delay and many technical challenges went off without a hinch, without a hitch. Um, it was wonderful to see just count straight down those stops at T minus 20 or T minus five or T minus 20 seconds uh, as we had gotten used to uh, with the shuttle program. Went off beautifully and this picture here was the last picture that we saw of uh, JWST heading off toward the L2 point. And just to remind you, this is uh, the approach to Tame came out of Earth here in a lazy loop out to go into a, a very wide orbit around the L2 point. So you don't sit at the L2 point, you actually orbit around it. That keeps it in the sunlight. Uh, most of the time, if you were at that, exactly at the L2 point, it'd be in the Earth's shade. Uh, but it also uh, is easier to control that way, and it it's minimizes the chance of collisions with other observatories that might be out there. This shows uh, JWST's unfolding sequence, which I don't need to, to go through because I think you saw that um, very nicely uh, in the opening video, but uh, various uh, stages that took a, a couple of weeks to actually get to the fully extended and final uh, version that looks like an operating telescope. So at that point, once everything had been unfolded and deployed, we got into the commissioning phase. Uh, and I'm not gonna, don't, <laughs> Don't worry that you can't read this. This is a very small print. I'm, I'm going to blow it up in the next slide. I'll take the left half and put it on the top and the bottom half on the bottom so you can see it. But I just wanted to show you the complexity of it and how long it takes. So here, uh, starting at uh, launch plus weeks is what's labeled here from zero to four is spacecraft deployment, mirror alignment and cool down goes uh, through week eight uh, out to week 12. All along you're starting to deploy the mirror segments and identify which segment is producing which spot of light and then start phasing them up so they all produce light at the same part uh, of the detector and give you a single image. So various stages of that uh, fine phasing here, final phasing as you get out toward week um, 16 or so. And at week 16 is where the instrument commissioning takes place. So up through here, you've just done the alignment of the optics, but you haven't actually checked out uh, the science instruments in any details yet. So you do, starting at, at week 16, the instrument commissioning uh, and the instrument node checkouts, uh, starting about week 19 or so, and that goes all the way out to week 28. And then the first images were taken shortly after that. So how many science instruments are there uh, on web? And you see here uh, the four called out, uh, one called near spec, near infrared spectrometer, near infrared spectrograph, the near ISS, um, the um, near infrared imager and slitless spectrogram, near cam, the near infrared camera, and MIRI, a uh, mid infrared instrument. So you've got uh, one spectrograph in near spec, one uh, combined imager and spectrograph with nearest, uh, near cam as a camera, and then MIRI. And the mid infrared, the only one that works in the mid infrared, uh, actually has both camera and spectrographs um, in it. To set the scale of this image, this is a, the background picture is a section of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. The image is about two thirds the size of the moon as you see it from Earth. And then over that, um, we've placed the web field of view. And notice here that the four instruments look at different parts of the field of view of the telescope. So if you want to observe, say, this bright galaxy here, you have to move the telescope so it lands in the MIRI aperture or the nearest aperture or one of the near cam apertures or near spec. So you don't, uh, you don't have detectors in all areas of the focal plane. You have to sample it uh, depending on what instrument that you do want to use. Another slide that I'm not going to read everything on, uh, just want to point out how many different instrument modes they are. So each instrument has multiple modes of operation. And if you're 
go and read on the right side here, you can see all the different ones, imaging, coronography, spectroscopy, time series, et cetera. Um, during commission, each mode has to be tested, calibrated, and verified. And only then is it decreed uh, to be ready for use by the astronomical community. We do carry out the process in parallel for all four instruments over L plus 16 to L plus 28 weeks. And this next chart just shows that in a different graphical form. Um, at the time that this chart was put together, everything had been done except for the coronography mode in near cam. But again, uh, this is why we had to wait so long to actually see the, the first science images. You had to go through all of these calibrations and tests to make sure everything was lined up um, and ready for, for use. So with bated breath, we got, uh, originally the plan was to actually wait and, until July to see the first images at all. But some of the early test images were so good um, that it was decided to, to show them and, and let everyone share in the excitement. So this is one of the early telescope alignment images um, this is the end of all the optical alignment, and you see it's absolutely gorgeous. These spikes here, uh, the six spikes are expected. They're caused by the hexagonal shape of the mirrors as the light diffracts off the edge of the segments. But you see a lot of uh, in-focus distant galaxies in the background as well. This kind of image sharpness check had to be done for each of the instruments. And you see here uh, the four science instruments that I mentioned earlier everything looking in great shape, and also some images from the fine guidance sensor, which is strictly speaking, not a science instrument, or not normally used as a science instrument, but used for guiding the telescope. But uh, as you can see, it actually gets some pretty dramatic pictures all by itself. And this is a gorgeous uh, page that shows uh, how beautifully focused everything is of all parts of the focal plane of the telescope, because as I pointed out, these different instruments sample different parts of the focal plane. So everything is not only aligned at the center, but in all directions around that. And it's just a, a gorgeous image. Next, I'm gonna zoom in on the MIRI data a little bit, just because there's a nice comparison here. Um, this is a sort of apples to apples comparison that shows uh, data from MIRI on the bottom. And on top, something from the Spitzer te Space Telescope, which was the previous infrared telescope. And you see the dramatic increase uh, in quality and in resolution uh, that you see here in the MIRI data, which is taken at 7.7 .7 microns, um, 77,000 angstroms, versus the Spitzer um, Space Telescope infrared array camera at eight microns, almost exactly the same wavelength. Spitzer one's a little bit redder but you can see the dramatic improvement here and how we can see the, uh, the gas in this area uh, in much, much finer detail. And then we have one more test image here that I just had to show you. This is from the Fine Guidance Sensor Thermal Testing. And again, this is not normally thought of as, as a science instrument, but it was a rich data set. It had 72 exposures over 32 hours because they were testing how, the, uh, how stable the imaging was uh, as the temperature changed. And that's important to know that uh, optimize your, your future observations. Because it was taken, there were so many exposures over such an extended period, it turned out to be among the deepest images of the universe ever taken, which is pretty good for a, a, a star tracker. Of course, that record lasted for about a week until the first light images came out from the science instruments. Uh, but at least for a moment, the FGS had its moment of glory. Okay, so now to the part that probably everybody was looking forward to, the first light JWST images. And the first one here in no particular order. This one is uh, shows SMAX 0723. This is a, mass, a, a massive cluster of galaxies. Uh, and we were observing this for, for two different purposes. One is to actually look at the cluster members themselves, um, which are the, the bigger and brighter galaxies that you see all around, as well as some fainter background galaxies. And also we're looking at these arcs in the image. They're a little faint, maybe a little hard uh, to see on here, but here's some of the best ones. Those are 
images of very, very distant galaxies behind this massive cluster. And this is the gravitational lens that I was talking about earlier. There is so much mass in this cluster in front of us that it can actually bend the light and amplify it that's coming from behind the cluster much further uh, out. The main galaxy cluster here is about 4.6 billion years uh, light travel time away. We are actually seeing uh, distant galaxies through this gravitational lensing process uh, at greater than 13 billion light years in the past. So it's a very powerful image. And this, of course, was even deeper than the FGS image that we showed you there. Um, there was also, this is, is mostly what you saw in the newscast, but there were uh, a spectrum taken off on a tiny light to the side. Well, if you look in the side image here, this is a slice in this area here at the nine o'clock position. If you go in here, there's a little tiny red dot. We actually got a spectrum of that smudge of light and not only uh, detected the galaxy, but saw some very clear emission lines here of specific elements like hydrogen and oxygen. People got really excited uh, about this pair of lines out here due to the oxygen. We did, I don't, don't think anyone really expected to be able to see that. So we not only got a very, very deep image of the universe here, we're actually starting to get some very uh, detailed physical information uh, through the spectra. And if we're able to do it on that tiny dot of red light that you can't really even see in this big image here, uh, imagine the richness of this that we're gonna have uh, when we were able to look at all of the thousands and thousands of galaxies in this image. We also uh, took a look at a exoplanet uh, seeing what JWST could do there. Um, the system is called WASP-96b. And here, this is a transmission spectrum. So the higher the plot goes here, the higher the data points, uh, the more light that's being blocked uh, by something in the planet's atmosphere. Basically here, we're looking at the light that gets through the planet's atmosphere along the edges of the disk. We have the sun, the, the star behind the planet, light comes through, is mostly blocked by the planet, but some sneaks through the atmosphere. And you can look at how that's different than the light that's coming from the star directly. And very excitedly, these four peaks, one there, one there, there, and there, are all signatures of water vapor. So we now have in the first exoplanet observation with JWSP, uh, signatures of water vapor, which is one of the possible signs of life. Now, of course, just seeing, um, water vapor by itself doesn't tell us there's life there. We need to find uh, other uh, chemical elements and signatures to, to be sure of that. But finding uh, water around this planet is, uh, you know, means we, A, we can detect water uh, given the right circumstances and gives us hope for uh, really finding, uh, be, being able to do what we want, characterizing the atmospheres of exoplanets. We also got what's called a transit light curve. And here you're just looking as the planet passes between the star and our cells. We're looking at the decrease in light coming from the star that's simply blocked by the planet. And you see that here, starlight on the left. That's when the planet's off to the side, it starts dipping. And this is when the planet is uh, directly in front of the star. And then it starts coming out of the eclipse and coming out the other side. What's spectacular about this, if you had looked at this kind of observation 10 or 20 years ago, you would see the noise in the signal would be almost as large as the total signal. And here it is so ultra clean uh, that you can use this to determine things uh, very more precisely like the planet's orbit, its radius um, and the like. And this data is just incredible when you look at it. We'll be able to do this on a whole slew of exoplanets with Webb. Moving on, uh, to the Southern Ring Nebula in two different uh, colors, near infrared light at the left and mid infrared light at the right. Uh, and you see even within JWST, there's dramatic differences in the structure. And if you compare this to a Hubble image in the ultraviolet, it would yet look completely different again. So having the different colors of light to look at um, lets you see different layers of the object at different temperatures. These are going to be showing material here that's cooler than what HST at a similar image. And you use them all together, uh, you'll get much more uh, information on the nebula. 
we moving further out here out of our own galaxy into the very distant um, galaxy. Not quite as far as in the deep field image that you saw earlier, but this is a very famous formation of galaxy called Stefan's Quintet. Uh, five galaxies that are, are interacting with each other strongly. So all of their structures are, are rather radically disrupted. You do see on the left here, signs these arcs of star formation that are happening as the galaxies interact and push material together and enable a stronger star formation. Uh, this on the left is a image combining observations from both NIRCAM and MIRI. So you're getting a broad range of wavelengths, more of a full color image. Uh, on the right is something taken uh, just with the uh, NIRCAM, I believe, that shows some things in finer detail. Um, you see shock fronts uh, in several spots here, these curved arcs, um, brilliant star, bits of star formation, um, et cetera. And then an image that you saw earlier from the Carina Nebula. And what you're actually seeing here, this nebula is part of a very massive nebula that covers a large section of the sky. The star field here is actually a hole in that nebula. So you're looking at the inner uh, edge uh, or the outer edge of, of this uh, hole that's full of stars, but it has been cleared out over the eons by radiation from the stars that formed within. The nebula itself is a hotbed of star formation. Um, you see a stream of faint material uh, coming off the uh, cloud and moving upward in the picture. You see um, uh, pinnacles of dust here where there's been a really high concentration of dust and gas that the uh, erosion um, from the starlight has not been able to, to pull off. Um, all sorts of structures and details. This is the kind of image that you could spend years looking at. If you look oh, right about here, there's a really odd arch shape, sort of like a, a tilted arch that's falling over, almost like an elephant trunk. And you look at stuff like that and you start thinking up really don't know how to make something like that. And so it's the kind of thing that intrigues you uh, and it challenges the theoreticians. You see some areas here where material has been cleared out by the hot stars inside and in general, very turbulent environment uh, with all sorts of things um, going on. This image is looking at the same area, but again, using images from both MIRI and NIRCAM. So looking at both the mid and the uh, near IR. Again, you see the, the streams coming off as material evaporates. You see a lot more stars in this image, a lot more uh, vacant areas as you uh, use the wider variety of uh, light, different colors of light to, uh, to probe it. And um, I think that's it for the new images. We will, as David mentioned earlier, be showing some near the end of the show that have come in more recently, uh, but we wanted to leave that for the um, the end time, I did want to remind folks, if it will advance, there we go. Uh, what's, where do we go from here? And JWST's driving goals uh, cover a variety of topics. Looking back, especially like you saw in the deep field at the early universe, trying to find the first stars and galaxies, and then trying to study how they evolve over time. And this is where working together, one, one topical area, we're working together with Hubble will work very nicely. Uh, JWST can observe the very earliest galaxies and Hubble can take over as we come closer to our own time and get a complete picture of how galaxies evolve with time. JWST would be looking at the stellar life cycle. These clouds here, like you saw in Carina, typically have both stars that are being born and stars that are dying within the same environment and provide a excellent opportunity for understanding how stars are born, evolve, and eventually uh, die. And of course, the search for other worlds is um, really the end goal of, of most of, of what we do, trying to find other worlds, especially trying to find habitable other worlds. And in the very, very end, signs of intelligence. We may not get there with Hubble or Webb, uh, but we are paving the way to finding and characterizing the planets uh, as the next step in that um, search for life elsewhere. And I'll say for more information, uh, home pages on the web for all uh, the big NASA missions are at nasa.gov 
slash Hubble slash Webb or slash Roman. The Roman Space Telescope comes after Webb. We've used this common nomenclature now so that you can easily find it. You can follow all our missions on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at NASA Hubble, at Webb Telescope, or at NASA Webb, and at NASA Roman. And you'll get continuous updates about what we're looking at, and some of the most recent observations are there, as well as on the websites. You're welcome to follow me uh, on my personal Twitter account, at Ken Astro. But be warned, if you do that, you'll get a lot of Star Trek, Disney, and Renaissance Festival info and photos, as well as NASA and Hubble. And I think I'll end there and hand it back over to David. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ken, for that. That was a fascinating look at the, well, the testing of, of the James Webb Space Telescope, to say the proper name, of course, at least once here, and uh, at the launch. And then, of course, these, these first science images, that it's truly a new age that we're in. We've crossed over into new territory, just like when uh, the Hubble Space Telescope it had its corrective lenses put on, of course, once they got the primary mirror fixed, it opened up a whole new era for astronomy. And we're seeing that happen again, which is incredibly exciting. So folks, I've seen questions come through our chat. We'll get to your questions in just a minute. But if you asked a question early on, you might want to type it back into the YouTube chat again, since it may have slipped by. Um, but I'm going to open up our questions with, I've noticed that there's sort of a, I don't know, a, a it looks like there's a stellar stream in that cluster image to me. I worked on uh, the Andromeda galaxy and as small galaxies fall in, they leave behind a trail. And it looks to me like there might be that in that cluster image. Um, you can see it there. Let me see if the, the pointer's still on. There it is. It's yeah, this okay. stuff that kind of goes around like that. Yeah, exactly. Is, is that actually what we're seeing there? Do, do folks know if that could be stars that are in the cluster between the galaxies? Yeah, uh, that's uh, exactly right. Um, we do think that's intracluster light that's uh, produced. It's basically stars that have been stripped out of the galaxies as they've collided with each other and, and kind of strewn uh, in the, uh, the core of the galaxy and actually out quite a ways uh, when you look at it. So it's yeah. a, a very cool way to be able to probe the gravitational potential of this massive galaxy cluster and a way to see where the dark matter is, because we can see how this fog of stars uh, moves, how it's changed by interactions with the overall gravitational potential, but it's gonna move in ways that probably can't be explained by the visible stars, and that'll give us a clue as to where the dark matter is and how much of it is in different spots. Wow, fascinating stuff. Uh, Chris, do you, have, do you have a question? Yeah, actually, I do. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that the uh, the JWST is floating without a tube. The optics are completely exposed to space. It seems like a dangerous thing to do. And I, I'd heard a rumor that uh, the telescope, uh, one of the mirrors, actually did get dinged by something. Is this serious? Is it a concern? Well, it's, it's not completely unexpected. Uh, this has even happened. Hubble has been hit by uh, various pieces of, of small micrometeorites over the years. We actually have a hole in the high gain antenna, one of the high gain antennas, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't hurt very much in that case because we still have the antenna is mostly intact and we have plenty of signal to get back to the Earth. In the web case, the hole is in one of 18 of the 18 mirror segments that are there. Um, I did actually check uh, with my counterpart on the web telescope uh, asking you know what they think the impact is and they say at the moment the change in throughput uh, how much light is gathered by the mirror and sent to the science instruments has not been measurable so it's not it's not impacting the amount of light gathered by the segment and by certainly by the telescope by very much it, it has definitely impacted the uh, what's called the wavefront the, the basically the focus it's uh, because the mirror has been distorted a little bit. Now, some of that you can correct for because these 18 mirror segments are actuated. That's how you get them all into phase and working together. So some of that uh, error you can probably take out with the actuators. It's, it's unclear at the moment um, how much can be taken out, but it is clear that we are still well within spec. The mirrors were the, working together and performing uh, to a large degree, but much better 
than the specs uh, that we had on them. So we had plenty of margin uh, for problems like this. And it was intentionally designed to be uh, overperforming because we knew that there is uh, debris out there and we, we expected um, to, to see events like this. We don't know, you know, until we see another kind of hit, whether we're going to see them at the frequency expected. Um, there are predictions for this, um, but one, you know, one case doesn't really tell us what the overall frequency is. So we'll wait and see if it's a bigger problem than we were expecting. But right now, it appears that we've got plenty of margin. Um, the light gathering capability is not hindered much at all, and the focus is still uh, well within our specifications. That's, yeah, it's great news. So, so Patrick, do you, do you have a question in mind? Oh, but you're muted. Now, take two, unmuted. Um, I find the atmospheric composition measurements very interesting and very exciting to find uh, water vapor um, on a, from an exoplanet. Is there also a way to do to determine the the temperature of the water vapor if they're forming clouds or or is it just you know, water vapor, it's so hot, it's just uh, gaseous. Um, there might be ways to do that by looking at the ratios of those four peaks. I'm not 100% sure. There is uh, the, the slide that's up there now actually shows the white dots, which are the measurements, and the blue line is the best fitting model. So you see we don't actually match it precisely. And uh, it's thought that one of the reasons um, that the observations are a little higher than the peaks in the model is because there are clouds, uh, as you mentioned over there, causing uh, more light to be blocked than just by the oxygen atoms themselves. Um, hmm. Interesting. And, and of course, those models, the, the, the blue line there, uh, contain all of the parameters that you're talking about, temperatures and densities, and what, as well as abundances, the amount of water. So mm -hmm. if we can find a model that actually matches the observations better, that's probably the, 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 the best way to kind of figure out the temperatures and densities is by fitting all of the data with a, a single model and not just using maybe simple line ratios like I first said. Thank you. Well, awesome. So I'm gonna to turn to our YouTube audience here. And I know I saw a question, is the MIRI instrument, which is the the longer wavelength infrared camera, is it expected to last as long as the telescope itself or will it sort of run out of coolant like what happened on um, Spitzer where the long wavelength instruments had to be shut down? Um, that's a good question. I think the cooler, and I, I, I don't wanna be quoted on this, I think the cooler it doesn't uh, use an expendable like that, that it's, it's basically a, a electric kind of cooler it's active it's not it's not just radiating into space but i don't think it's uh, quite as fragile as the ones that that had a uh, a, a coolant in it like the nickmas did on hst for instance yeah if that was different dave please do say no that was my understanding as well that 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 was one of the reasons for having these big sunshades was to get things a lot cooler and then using other means you know other other space refrigeration, shall we call it, we're able to get down to the neck to, to the lower temperatures. So I, I don't believe there's any coolant to run out on. Um, there was another question that they wanted to know, was the cluster image, was that chosen because nothing was there? Or did they pick that image because we knew that cluster was going to be there? Uh, yeah, we, we certainly knew the, uh, the cluster was going to be there, the SMAX 0723. Um, and we have other observations of it, but just not as deep. So yeah, it was picked because the cluster was there uh, and we knew it, it had enough mass to do the gravitational lensing because uh, of course we wanted to see what JWST could do uh, when it was given that extra tool. Both HST and JWST can actually see further back in time, further out into space using the gravitational lensing technique by observing clusters that have a lot of, of mass and can amplify the light force than they would without that, uh, you know, side by side looking without in a direction that doesn't have a big cluster like this, JWST will go further and deeper because it's got a larger mirror, uh, but they both can go better than you would think, you know, 
from basic telescope information uh, when they do look in the direction of a massive cluster. Yeah, the big the big cluster acts as a well as a gravitational lens, and it allows us to see further away, and it magnifies the brightness of these galaxies as well. Um, a lot of these arcs you're seeing are the same galaxy. So there are multiple images of the same galaxies that are back there. And, and stunningly, some of the images we get are kind of normal-ish looking. Um, I, I don't want to point any out directly because I don't have the map in front of me, but folks have already started to map which of these galaxies is the number one galaxy, say, and there's multiple images of galaxy one, and then galaxy two, there might be four or five or six images of it. And some of them look remarkably like a little spiral hanging out there. And they're not, <laughs> yes. you know, these are not, some of them are not as disturbed as you might think they are, but there's gonna be some fascinating papers coming up very, very soon. And the real fun begins is when you try to model the mass distribution in the galaxy cluster, because if you do that, you can actually reconstruct the images of these dis from these distorted images. Yeah, but that's, that's a really difficult thing. There, and there is a mass really model for, for this, believe it or not. And I don't believe it's been published, but I've been, I was tweeting when this was first released that very first night, I was tweeting back and forth with some of the folks that are uh, on that team. Uh, one of the postdocs that was on that team that had helped develop a model. And she said, here's the model we have for it. And it'll just get better now, now that they have this amazing JWST image that the, they're going to be able to tinker and improve the model. And then, like you said, they can reconstruct what these look like. It's just, it's just super, super thrilling stuff. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask one more question. I think it was one of our first questions that was out there. Um, so sorry, folks, that we didn't have, uh, um, well, I'll ask two. So the two questions were, are how much of the science from Hubble will be verified by JWST? And um, the next question that I'll ask, the final ones are, can JWST observe complex modules like would exist on Earth? In other words, like human-made chemicals. Could we use it to go find intelligent life, let's say, that might be polluting an exoplanet? Would that be something we'd be able to, to see with Webb? You know, I'm not aware of any particular chemical compound that falls in that category. Um, I mean, who knows until you start looking at these detailed spectra, something might um, pop up. But you'll notice that when you look at the uh, exoplanet spectrum that we had here, uh, we're seeing some pretty broad features uh, due to the water vapor. And presumably that's a very abundant uh, molecule in, in this atmosphere. So you're probably, I would guess, gonna have a hard time seeing trace constituents of anything. Yeah, you're, you're, you're at this ability here where you're probably looking for things that are major uh, parts of the atmospheres here. So, I mean, especially if you had a, a really bad industrial contamination, maybe you could see it, but I would think in, in most cases, we're looking for the, uh, the molecules that are primary constituents of the atmosphere yeah. and not trace stuff. I think uh -huh. it's, it's probably a, another observatory or two further in the future. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, folks, including uh, Amber Strong, Dr. Strong, has, has said that Webb is not designed necessarily to see, to really to prove life is on one of these exoplanets. It can see some of the constituents, and who knows what clever tricks people might use in the future, but we really need a big optical space telescope that can do spectroscopy in conjunction with JWST. Hubble's just a little too small to be able to do it and you need the resolution. But if we had say a 10 meter or a 15 meter class optical telescope up in space, along with Webb, we could leverage the two together and get a much clearer picture if there was life. So the final question that was from our, our YouTube chat, um, again, is are there any Hubble uh, discoveries, quote unquote, that you think we can really nail down and verify with JWST? Do you have any in mind? I know that the answer to that is, of course, of course, they'll be able to, but there are there any that you're looking forward to that were sort of a, eh, maybe this is happening, but now that we have JWST, we can really figure it out. Well, I think the the obvious thing is in trying to understand the, the very oldest um, galaxies, the uh, very earliest stars that Webb is going to have the sensitivity to really look at. We've uh, recently, Hubble has found, was been able to image the most distant individual star ever seen. 
and we probably have, or at least had the record for the, the most distant uh, galaxy of 100 billion or 200 billion stars. But when we're looking at, at those, they're tiny smudges of light um, with not a lot of uh, ability to see the structure in them, with not a lot of uh, ability to get a good spectrum to really see the chemical constituents and uh, understand the physical parameters, temperature, pressure, density, and the like. Uh, Webb with its larger mirror and with its infrared sensitivity ought to be able to see these very distant objects, either stars or galaxies, uh, much better with a lot more light coming into the instruments so that you can spread it out a little bit more, get a, a better look at the details of the spectrum and what kind of uh, elements and molecules are in it and what the physical conditions are um, just because you have the light and the resolution that you don't quite get in the infrared with HST. So that's the area where I look for the biggest improvements. Um, but I'm sure every time we launch a, a, a new telescope like this with substantially increased capabilities, uh, we got a, a large chunk of the results coming out are in the unexpected category. I think with Hubble now, we're probably at a level that maybe half of the science that comes out of it is stuff that was not expected before it was launched. Uh, just, you know, com completely, not superfluous, but uh, just uh, com completely um, out of the blue, as it were. And I'm sure the same thing is going to happen with JWST. That's the fun of it. You do the stuff you expect to do and you do it really well. And then a whole bunch of new uh, information comes out and some of it will puzzle us. Like the discovery that the expansion of the universe is accelerating instead of slowing down with time, which was partly Hubble and partly uh, observed by many other telescopes uh, around the ground. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Ken. Um, really appreciate you staying up late with us tonight. And uh, I know you're going to stick around at least for our next um, topic. But before we do, I'm going to do uh, the introduction to our show a little bit, too. I forgot to thank uh, the uh, City of Los Angeles and the Department of Recreation and Parks that owns and operates Griffith Observatory, of course. Um, All Space Considered is coming to you courtesy of Griffith Observatory and the City of LA and the Department of Recreation and Parks. So everybody make sure you you thank yourselves when you pay those parking tickets to help fund us. Actually, the, the Rec and Parks is actually funded through the charter, so we don't have to worry about parking tickets. That's a joke. But we do also want to make sure we thank Griffith Observatory Foundation, who's our nonprofit partner and really helps us out with so much we do. And um, we actually had a fun uh, chat with uh Ken before the before the program with our foundation members. So a little extra benefit for them that I just wanted to mention. Um, but Ken, again, just a fantastic look at, at uh, the JWST, the new telescope. I can't wait to hear, have you back in person to talk about the next round of, of science images. We'll have to have you back. And then of course, when the Roman telescope gets launched, we'll have you back to talk about that because that's just, I'm super excited about a telescope that'll be able to get M31 and just a handful of pointing. So it'll be great fun. Well, now we're gonna turn to our next topic, which is the In Memoriam for Nichelle Nichols. Um, our program comes from the, the Nimoy Event Horizon Theater, the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon at Griffith Observatory usually. In fact, I believe it's open tonight. Uh, we're open to the public and there are folks probably in there watching All Space Considered. But one of his co-stars of Star Trek recently passed away. Uh, she was an actress, singer, dancer, and also a NASA advocate. So um, we're gonna remember uh, Nichelle with just a, a few images and a little video that we made. Um, she actually started, like we said, as a singer and a dancer. And in fact, when she was 15 years old, she sang with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. So I'd love to hear a recording of that myself. I did, did a little digging and I wasn't able to find anything, but um, that's just super cool to think about having her singing with uh, that. Now we did get to hear her sing on Star Trek. Um, she of course played Lieutenant Uhura um, she was the communications officer. She was the, the lead in the communications realm. Um, later, she was promoted in Star Trek II to commander. So that was fantastic. And of course, she was also on the animated series. A lot of folks don't know there was a Star Trek animated series, but she uh, provided the voice of Uhura for that. Um, she was saying, of course, 
many of the episodes and had important roles, but one of the roles that people often remember, and folks get it a little bit wrong, that they think it was the first interracial kiss on television. Well, it wasn't quite the first, but it was one of the first handful, and certainly one of the first for a Black woman with a white man. There were several Asian, uh, Caucasian kisses, things like that, but Nonetheless, this is one of the, the most important ones. Star Trek was a, a fairly popular television show. It was on a major network, and it was at a time that television was being watched by a lot of folks. So to have um, a moment like that, to really make people question their opinions, question what they thought about um, this moment, it, it was you know Star Trek kind of stepping into the realm of social commentary, that, which they often did. When you go back and watch those old episodes, a lot of the, the, the plots were really referring to things that were in the news in the day, whether it was the Vietnam War or other aspects like that. They were, they were quite political, they really were. So um, today folks look back at it and think it's kind of cheesy, but at the time it, it was quite groundbreaking. Michelle went on to become a NASA advocate um, in addition to having a career doing a lot of other things, but here at All Space Considered, we'll talk about her advocacy just here for a moment. You can see her there on the left giving a lecture. Um, in the upper right is a picture in the control room there. And then in the lower right, she's actually on board the Sophia Airborne Observatory. It's a big 747 that has a hole cut in the side that they, they took infrared images actually to get up above the atmosphere a little bit. They took some of those. Sophia is going to be decommissioned in the near future unless they find more funding or another source. Uh, somewhat unfortunately, but with the Webb telescope, it's, it's an expensive project to be running at the same time. But she was a big advocate for it. And we put together a little video here to show off some of her, uh, to hear from her and show off some of what she did. And it starts out with kind of a, a, a moment for her that a lot of folks don't know about where she, uh, she had a connection to Dr. Martin Luther King, and she eventually sang at his, his funeral even. So, um, but let's hear it from her. I said, well, I'm leaving Star Trek. He's, he said, you cannot. You cannot. For the first time on television, we will be seen as we should be seen every day. As intelligent, quality beautiful people who can sing, dance, and, but who can go into space. Strong interference on subspace, Captain. The planet must be a natural radio source. I'm Michelle Nichols, but I still feel a little bit like Lieutenant Uhura on the Starship Enterprise. Astronaut Alan Bean has agreed to show me some of the training and evaluation that new astronaut candidates will be undergoing. Captain, at last. Since you're sitting in the commander's seat, Michelle, let me show you how you might fly it if we were in space. Oh boy, huh? Now the shuttle will be taking scientists and engineers, men and women of all races, into space, just like the astronaut crew on the Starship Enterprise. This is your NASA, a space agency embarked on a mission to improve the quality of life on planet Earth right now. Hi. We're going to open the door. Door moment. Hi, I'm Michelle Nichols. I played Lieutenant Uhura, Chief Communications Officer aboard the Starship Enterprise on Star Trek, the original series. Today, I'm aboard Sophia, a NASA aircraft flying into our stratosphere with an infrared telescope to observe light coming from interstellar objects. Sophia helps astronomers learn more about the birth of stars, formation of planetary systems, black holes, and more. 
Sophia reminds me of the Starship Enterprise. It goes where no man or woman has ever gone before. Lieutenant Uhura to Security Officer Davison. Davison here. I want an all-woman security team on every transporter immediately. No one is to transport down to the planet unless it is on my order. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. What are you doing? Taking command of this ship. So I really appreciate the uh, video we made there. And folks, if you need to rewatch it to fix the volume levels, it was a little quiet for me. But nonetheless, um, she was a re remarkable woman. And Ken, you know, who knew we'd see you so soon again, especially with uh, Nichelle here. Can you tell us a little bit about where you met her? Sure. Um, this was a, a very fortunate occurrence, but Nichelle was pretty active in the, in the convention circuit. Uh, appeared at a lot of cons, and uh, this was in spring of 2019, so it was one of her last con appearances. I think most of us uh, were aware of this, and um, it was quite a crowd trying to, to get in to see her. This was at the in Denver at the Starfest con that had gone on for something like 40 years, one of the early fan-run conventions, uh, and she was there, and I got a chance to uh, go to her autograph table and she was, um, you know, at this point, she was starting to have some, some issues health-wise, but once she sat down in that char chair with a line of people out there, she just like snapped right up uh, and fell into the routine that, you know, she had done so many times before. And she was the warmest uh, person of, I think, of any of the, the stars that I've met over the years. Um, you know, took my hand, uh, just, gave me this huge smile. And as you can see her there, you know, looked happy and in her element there to, to, to be with her fans. Um, and it's uh, one of the more memorable um, encounters that I've had with any uh, uh, cast member or, or worker in Trek over the years. So I was very lucky to catch her uh, when I did. Um, yeah, and, well, you know, just uh, it's, a, it's a great photograph of her giving the lip long and prosper and, gripping your hand. And like I said, the, the smile on her face is genuine. She was a, a genuine person and really, um, you know, I heard over and over again from folks after she passed of commentary of how, you know, she was comfortable with her stardom and um, really loved her fans and loved being able to promote NASA and space. So, um, you know, just let's all take a moment and remember her when we can. Um, raise a drink to her and, uh, you know, toast everything she did. And also think about everybody she inspired to become part of NASA, to go up into space and uh, to really ex explore this universe. You know, Griffith Observatory, our mission is to help people, inspire people to ponder and observe the heavens. And Nichelle was really one of us. She helped uh, folks get inspired to want to learn more about the universe. So, um, you know, thank you, Nichelle, for all you did. And uh, here she was, of course, at the, on the set of uh, Star Trek on the original Enterprise. This was a touring exhibit, I believe, um, that she was at. So they got a great photo of her there, even with their little earpiece. So, well, time to move on. And Katie, I think you're here somewhere to talk about some beautiful astronomical images after honoring a, a, a beautiful, inspirational woman. So, Katie, what do you have for us tonight? Oh, so there are some beautiful images to share with you. This first one was taken by Blake Estes, who um, used to work at Griffith Observatory, and this is Comet um, Panstars, uh, C2017 K2. And this comet just made its closest approach to Earth on July 14th, which was 168 million miles um, beyond the orbit of Mars. And this is the lovely full moon over Griffith Observatory from July. And then these next set of images um, are, I was lucky enough to head to a few national parks this past summer. And this is the great prismatic spring of Yellowstone, which was just incredible, all of those colors. And then also from Yellowstone, this is the um, canyon with the lower falls. And you can see a rainbow in there, which was just beautiful. This is a sun halo 
right behind the clouds. You can see it there. And another rainbow. This one is from um, the Rocky Mountain National Park. And this um, is a recent image. This was a storm um, over Staten Island taken by Alexander Kravenyshev, who gives us beautiful images. And this was actually taken yesterday evening. This is an incredible sunset from Moab, Utah. And then this next image is a sunset taken inside of Griffith Observatory from our camera obscura. This was taken by museum guide, Laura Smith. And you can actually see the sunset visible through the camera obscura inside the building from mid-April through late August. So this is a really cool capture that she got. And then I was able to see some incredible wildlife. Um, this is from Zion National Park. This is actually the California condor um, from Angel Landing. And in 1987, the, the condor, um, there were only 27 condors left in the wild and the population has been increasing and has reached over 460 um, with only 170 wild homes in California. So this was something really incredible to see. And then some beautiful bison. This is from Yellowstone National Park. And then a couple of my favorite images. These are bighorn sheep. And then we have a pika, this is from the Rockies, and pika um, are, they live uh, above the tree line. So it was really cool to spot one of those. And then we've been having a spike in noctilucent clouds. This is taken by Daniel Fisher in Germany. And um, I've been told he watches All Space Considered sometimes. So it was really lovely to get this image from him. And if you look at this graph here, you can see the red line is 2022, the noctilucent cloud frequency, and the gray area is uh, 2007 to 2021. And one of the reasons for um, noctilucent cloud occurrences like this are rocket launches, actually. So the, the black line there are rocket launches. The red line are the cloud frequency of noctilucent clouds. So when um, rockets launch, the plumes of water vapor um, are carried by the wind uh, toward the polar mesosphere and they become raw material for noctilucent clouds. So that helps the increase. And then we'll just show some of the beautiful images captured by, um, by some people all across the world. This is from Oliver Schwen. And then he also sent me this other colorful image, which is just beautiful. And then we have some noctilucent clouds over uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And this image here was taken by a cosmic ray balloon. This is actually the um, Oak Fire, which was um, in Yosemite National Park, but the cosmic ray balloon um, was launched to, for scientists to research a geomagnetic storm. And it turns out that cosmic rays have actually been down. They come from deep space. Um, from things like supernova. And the gray lines here are, they show the solar cycles and the solar minimum we can see there. And as solar cycle 25 begins, as we're reaching maximum, um, the cosmic rays are going down. And that's actually because when the solar cycle is at its maximum, the coronal mass ejections in the strong magnetic field actually wipe away those cosmic rays. And then this lovely image is um, actually of the shadow from the Earth in between the SDO, Solar Dynamic Observatory, and the Sun. We are in the solar eclipse season in space, and this happens twice a year. So that's a really cool image. And on to some solar system weather. This was a coronal mass ejection that happened on June 30th on the far side of the Sun. So nothing coming toward Earth from this one. And then some incredible sunspots that we can see from this past month. This one was 3053, and that's 48 hours of development. And this sunspot actually has um, two dark poles that are cores that are wider than Earth. And then this next one you see here, kind of in the lower left of the image, is 3055. 
And this is um, stretches more than 100,000 kilometers from end to end and more than a dozen dark cores. So lots of solar activity happening. This one was taken from David Pinsky, who's a museum guide here at Griffith Observatory on July 15th. So it's a sun filament, which is turning into a prominence. And also on July 15th, if you look right in the middle um, upper of the image here, you can see what they call a cannon of fire that opened from the sun, which is a dark filament of magnesium. And uh, the canyon, uh, stretched diagonally across the video, if you can see it there, it was 20,000 kilometers high and 10 times as long. And then this is from July 21st. This is a solar tsunami from Sunspot 3060, which exploded in the early hours of July 21st, and that produced a C-class solar flare. And the tsunami is the shadow, uh, shadowy shock wave seen racing away from the sun. This actually caused um, the US Air Force reported a type two solar radio burst from this. And also from July 21st, there was a coronal mass ejection, which you can see there. And there's actually another faint halo, full, um, full halo coronal mass ejection. And that one was launched from the tsunami. And then finally, this was taken recently by museum guy David Pinsky. This is a huge solar prominence from August 3rd. And with all this solar activity, we get some incredible images of Aurora. This one was from Mary Beth in Michigan. Some beautiful, beautiful colors there. And this was taken July 2nd. And then a couple from Robert Snatch. Um, and this was a crack in the Earth's magnetic, uh, magnetic field on July 7th, and the crack stayed open for 14 hours, pouring um, solar wind in and produced a long-lasting G-class uh, geomagnetic storm. And Robert said this is the first aurora he's been able to capture in a very long time. So those are some beautiful images. And then one more here from Mary Beth, which I just thought was incredible. This one is from Michigan as well on July 22nd. And then the Sophia telescope captured some of the southern lights. And this is a short and sped up video here of the incredible aurora captured from Sophia. And then I'll just leave you with a still there. So some, a lot of solar activity and some incredible images. And that's it for solar system weather. I believe you. I was in the, the YouTube chat saying hello to everybody that's been enjoying these beautiful images with us. And I also typed into there, we're going to be going long tonight because we're, we're taking our, our own sweet time with everything, but we're having too much fun. We're not going to rush through things. So if you have somewhere to be shortly after nine, well, you'll have to return to the stream to watch the rest of the show later with us because um, we'll probably be going at least till 9.15 tonight, maybe even, I don't think 9.30, should we shoot for it? Anyway, so just so everybody knows, we're gonna go a little long, so, um, but you don't wanna go anywhere right now because right now we are, um, again, graced by Jared Head's presence. We were saying, um, folks in the chat, stand Jared Head. They wanted to know where you were and i said you were a little bit shy and that yeah you you know you you didn't want to quite be in the limelight um which is not a true statement jared jared's not shy about his love for the universe and love for rockets and but honestly i am thrilled to have you here tonight joining us to talk about um out to launch but uh, first before we do that we actually have patrick so with our sky report so hang in there folks i just got so excited by seeing jared pop in I don't know what I was doing there. But anyway, so Patrick, take it away. What do we have to look at in the sky? Well, there is some excitement happening in the sky this month. And we'll jump right in with the Perseid meteor shower, which uh, peaks on the night of the 12th through to the morning of the 13th. This is uh, one of two strongest showers of the year, uh, the other being the Geminids in mid-December. Uh, the Perseid uh, meteor shower gets its name because uh, the Perseids appear to radiate just above the constellation Perseus, 
uh, which you can see rising in the northeast um, on, uh, on the, the summer evening. Now, um, this year, um, the uh, Persid meteors, uh, the observations of them will be hampered by the light of the near full moon so we'll only see some of the brightest uh, meteors from the shop, but it's still worth going out to take a look. Uh, you, might, you will be rewarded at, by at least a few uh, bright fireballs that will uh, pierce the, the, the glow of the moon um, in, the, uh, in the sky. So uh, that's uh, something to look for um, and worth going out to uh, take a look, um, at least if you can catch one or two of these Perseids, then uh, this is a good, Good shower to watch. Um, the moon hampers the showers uh, once every two to three years. So, so the next two years, uh, it should be good. Now we're gonna to turn to the evening sky, um, looking towards the south in the evening. Um, there are two prominent constellations uh, of the summer sky. Um, one of them is Scorpius the Scorpion, uh, which uh, if you Connect the dots, it looks like a scorpion. It has the heart of the scorpion is the star Antares. And then you can follow the curve down to its, uh, to its uh, tail. Uh, incidentally, Antares, I'll just make a mention here, is uh, Chris Butler's favorite star. So let's take a telescopic uh, look at this star, which is uh, uh, through a telescope. Uh, it is a red supergiant 550 light years away from Earth. And it's, it's just incredible uh, just to see the reddish coloration of, the, of this star um, uh, in this picture that was taken through, um, I think, it, oh yeah, this picture was taken by Anthony Perkic, our very own Ant Anthony Perkic, um, telescope demonstrator here at Griffith Observatory. The other constellation is right next to Scorpius. Uh, this is Sagittarius the Archer. It's uh, bright stars, if you connect the dots, uh, forms the shape of the Sagittarius teapot. Um, this, these two constellations are kind of hard to see. You can just barely make them out uh, from our brightly light polluted skies here in Los Angeles or any bright urban area. Um, this next picture was taken 75 miles away from Los Angeles. And uh, you can just see the cons two constellations in, um, in the suburban uh, light. Uh, we'll join the dots there and you can see them uh, more clearly. Uh, the star Antares in Scorpius and at the tail of, of the scorpion, there's a bright star called uh, Charlotte. Now in a dark sky area, uh, as this picture shows, the Milky Way actually bisects the two constellations and uh, in this area, uh, which is close to the, which is actually near the center of our Milky, own Milky Way galaxy. Um, this area is loaded with many star clusters and uh, nebulae. And two of the brightest ones are indicated there. It's uh, M7 and M8. M stands for Messier, uh, the Messier catalog of objects um, that was created by Charles Messier uh, just to distinguish these objects from uh, comets because Messier was a comet hunter and didn't want to be bothered with seeing faint objects that he could mistakenly uh, 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 identify as comets. So um, what do these look like? Well, here's an image uh, taken by Anthony Perkic again. Um, M7 is one of the most prominent uh, open star clusters in the sky. It's actually called the Ptolemy cluster because it was first observed by uh, Ptolemy uh, back in 130 AD. And uh, at that time, uh, he was cataloging some of the things that he could see uh, just because there was no binoculars, nothing, no cell phones back then. And um, he uh, cataloged this object unceremoniously as Object 567. Um, this star cluster uh, contains about 100 stars, about 200 million years old, and spans 25 light years across and lies about 1,000 light years away. The other object, which is also visible to barely to, to, the, to the unaided eye and through a pair of binoculars, and in this beautiful picture taken through a telescope, is M8, the Lagoon Nebula, a large bright emission nebula located in the constellation Sagittarius the Archer that we saw earlier on. Uh, this is a star forming uh, nebula and uh, is just about 4,100 light years from Earth. Um, looking just above, 
uh, Scorpius and Sagittarius um, is the constellation Aquila the Eagle. And if we look overhead, Aquila e the Eagle is accompanied by two other constellations, uh, Cygnus the Swan and Lyra the Harp. In each of these constellations, uh, there are bright stars. And these bright stars, um, let me just go to the next slide, are uh, Vega in Lyra the Harp, uh, Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, and Alta in Aquila the Eagle. Join them up with a line and you get the asterism known as a summer triangle. Taking a closer look through a telescope at these stars, they are blue white in color uh, photographically. Uh, they're actually in the spectral type of A, which uh, makes them kind of bluish white um, as you um, image them through a telescope. Um, just, they're not just points of light in the sky. Vega is uh, 25 light years away as the fifth brightest star in the night sky. Deneb is a whopping 1400 light years away and it's the 19th brightest star in the sky, but it's a blue white supergiant, 203 times the diameter of the sun, incredible. Outer is a mere 16 light years away, two times the diameter of the sun, but it has incredible rapid rotation. Uh, it turns once on its axis, uh, nine hours compared to the sun's 25 days. And this means that uh, outer is not spherical, but it's flattened at the poles due to its high rotation rate. Well, Patrick, can you go back for yeah. a second? I have a, yeah. a quick question that I just noticed. Um, um, let me go back, okay. Yeah, back one to these beautiful star images. Yeah. Now, to me, it looks like Altair and Vega were taken by the same telescope because of the pattern that I'm seeing around them, the sort of diffraction spikes we're seeing. Because of course these stars are so far away that with these telescopes, there's still points of light, but we've magnified that light and we've gathered more of it, but we're not actually seeing the disk of the star, but the patterns we're seeing, to me, I think we can identify the telescope from that. Is that true? That's true. Um, and you are correct. Uh, Vega and Alta were taken by uh, Anthony Perkett, our, uh, um, our uh, telescope demonstrator uh, through his eight inch uh, Newtonian reflector. The telescope uh, that took that picture, I'm not certain of the source, but it was an, uh, a different instrument. But you are correct, uh, Vega and Alta were taken by the same telescope, just looking at the spike pattern of the, uh, of the stars there. Well, very cool. Thank you for, for answering that. I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, we'll go to, okay, so, um, in addition to Scorpius and Sagittarius, uh, if we look to the southeast, uh, we see the very faint constellation Capricornus de Sego, which is almost invisible from Los Angeles, unless you use a pair of binoculars to see some of the stars in that area of the sky. Uh, but there is a bright point of light, and that bright point of light is the planet Saturn, and Saturn will be up in the evening sky um, for quite a while, and it's the first planet in our evening sky uh, that we have seen um, um, uh, for a while because uh, most of, of the other planets are still hiding out in the morning sky. So taking a look at the morning sky um, over to the south, to the east is the brilliant planet Venus. Venus is low um, uh, in the twilight there in the morning uh, dawn twilight and it will move back into the glare of the sun uh, towards the uh, end of the month and through early September. So you can uh, certainly go out and catch Venus while you can before it disappears into the sun's glare. The other two planets are much higher up in the southeast and the south. Red planet Mars is getting brighter, it's approaching us and getting closer. And also the planet uh, Jupiter, which is the second brightest planet in the sky, is way up there in the south. Uh, the moon is just about uh, one and a half degrees below it on the 15th. And then uh, Saturn, which has been up all night, is about to set in the southwest. On the 19th, uh, the moon moves to, uh, in conjunction with uh, Mars and, uh, and is very close to it, uh, roughly about two degrees. And we'll take a close look uh, within that circle. And this is a very pretty sight. Uh, the moon, you see the moon is uh, sandwiched between Mars and then just above it, the Pleiades star cluster in the constellation Taurus de Bull. And talking about constellations, uh, Taurus 
Orion and Gemini, our winter favorites, are just emerging from the uh, light of the morning dawn. So uh, you can catch those. Uh, they, they look very beautiful against the, uh, just before the sun rises. Also, uh, just below Orion is Sirius. Sirius is uh, the brightest star in the night sky. And uh, you can just, this is kind of a, almost the first time uh, you can see Sirius. And uh, when you see Sirius for the first time, it's, uh, it's called the Helical Rising of Sirius. And um, in ancient times, in ancient Egypt, uh, the sighting of Sirius uh, just in the eastern sky, uh, the first sighting of it, uh, roughly coincided with the uh, flooding of the Nile. Now moving to our next uh, events, um, the moon phases for this month, uh, we have uh, first quarter on the 5th, full moon on the 11th, last quarter on the 18th, and new moon is on the 27th. And that's all for this month's Sky Report, so um, enjoy and see if you can catch a few of those Perseids. It's going to be a little bit harder this year with the, the moon being so full around the peak time, but the Perseids are a broad shower, so you know you can go out um, a few days after and you know hopefully the moon will rise a little later and later each night so if you go out on the, the weekend right after the full moon you still might have a chance to catch some Perseids so uh, a lot of fun anyway thank you for that Patrick always a pleasure seeing um, the sky report from from you um, I also want to point out that Patrick puts the sky report on YouTube for us all every month um, so if our show is this late you've already recorded a version of this and put it on YouTube for folks to check out. So if you wanna see the sky report closer to the first of the month, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, give it a thumbs up and uh, you know, ring the little bell as they like to say, and you'll get notified when Patrick posts his sky report and you can check it out before we do All Space Considered. So thank you for all that work you put into all this, Patrick. We appreciate it. So um, let's see here. Um, Looks like we've got our Mars update next, which we can turn to it. Although I'm a little confused. I'm confused where we have where we have Jared lined up. We're gonna have to figure that out. Um, oh, good. It looks like Jared gets to come in after Mars, so he has to sit through all of this um, and listen to me talking about Mars, which is gonna be more fun for me. So I can get this out of the way and then I can get ready for the rockets. All right, so anyway, folks, time for a Mars update with my fancy lettering. Um, the Curiosity rover turned 10. It's crazy thinking that it actually landed 10 years ago on August 5th, 2021, 2012, 2021. It's 2022 now. Um, in 2012, um, came in with the crazy sky crane maneuver, landed in Gale Crater and has been doing some awesome science. So let's step through some of this. The Mars Science Laboratory is really the name of the mission. Curiosity is the name of the rover. And stats are over 3,540 souls, which that's a Martian day on the surface. And it's driven more than 17 miles um, on those tore up, bashed around wheels um, that it's still, still driving on them. Um, you can see the path that it's taken, at least part of it, going up to Mount Sharp. Um, it is now finally going up the actual mountain that's in the center of the, the crater, but it did cross Vera Rubin Ridge, which I just really like. And it took that long detour around that uh, those sand dune there, sand dunes to make sure it didn't get stuck in the sand dunes. Um, now, what has it been finding out? Let's take a look here. Um, so highlights, first of all, evidence of persistent liquid water. Well, that's what it was sent there to find out. Was there water on the surface? And was this an environment that might have been habitable for life? Could life have lived there? And one of the things you need is liquid water. And indeed, right off the bat, it saw evidence for a stream bed. The stream bed, the water was probably, oh, about ankle deep, and it was flowing just a few miles per hour. So it was going rather slowly, drifting along, but it was persistent. It was long there long enough to leave behind um, the pebbles that you'd see in the bottom of a stream that had been there a long time. So persistent water, um, one of those resources that life needs to, to get going. Um, it also saw evidence for the schnapps uh, uh, atoms. So it's a, a little bit of a joke with, 
with people that study life and astrobiology to call what, what does life need? It needs schnapps. Well, that stands for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And indeed, it saw all of those. And it also saw organic carbon. Well, organic molecules are carbon molecules that are in these long chains. And it, it, they form the amino acids and things like that we need for life. Well, where did it see them? Well, first of all, on the left, the opportunity um, rover saw evidence for, I don't know why we have an arrow on our, well, that's my own arrow. Never mind. Ignore me, everybody. Um, on the left there is our Opportunity Rover image that it saw some organic compounds. And on the right, Curiosity saw a very, very similar type of rock, sampled it, took a look at it, and indeed um, saw this, this evidence for the schnapps um, the schnapps atoms were right in there. And here's the drill sample where it saw the organic molecules in, in that rock, drilled into it, saw the schnapps, are, uh, the schnapps chemicals and the, the organic molecules. And then in a separate site, this is a different drill site, obviously, it saw an interesting uh, silicon dioxide compound that only forms at a certain temperature, at a relatively high temperature, but a, a lower pressure. So how, what was the environment like that was able to make this crystalline uh, silicon dioxide. I don't think they've quite figured that out yet, but maybe a hot spring. Maybe the water was percolating through these rocks and it was able to leave them behind. So it was also finding some interesting things we didn't expect with this little traveling uh, chemistry detection kit that, that Curiosity had. Um, now, chem uh, Curiosity also saw seasonal methane. We had seen some hints that there was methane in the atmosphere that kind of came and went with the seasons. Indeed, uh, Curiosity did measure that in Gale Crater. And where does it come from? Well, could it be microbes? Could it be aliens? Maybe. But it also could be water interacting with olefin rock. So could, could there have been water down below, deep in the deep in the cracks down in there that's still a liquid and it creates these methane clathrate storage sites? And then as those get broken up, there's outgassing into the atmosphere. So the seasonal outgassing is caused by the, the movement of the rock as it heats up and cools down. Um, or maybe as the water down below moves around, could there be water down below there still? Maybe, we don't know, but the methane is a, is a little bit of a mystery. We need to figure out what is it doing there and, and why, we, we don't know. But it, it could be microbes that are down still buried in the Martian dirt, um, Martian microbes. Another thing Curiosity did was it found dangerous radiation to humans. That's right, the kind of radiations that would give these astronauts big tumors. So if you're gonna walk around on the surface of Mars, if you think you're gonna set up a, a Mars colony of some sort, well, you need to worry about the radiation coming from space because Mars does not have the magnetic field you need to protect you from it. It doesn't have a thick enough atmosphere to protect you um, from it. It's only about 1% as thick as Earth's atmosphere. And the magnetic field is very patchy and sticks out in weird spots and doesn't comprehensively protect you. Um, any sort of habitats would be need to be buried underground to provide some uh, protection for the astronauts. So when you go out and explore like this, you'd need to have a space suit that was resistant to, to what radiation was there. You'd have to track your radiation exposure as well. Um, and in fact, there is a, an experiment on perseverance that has different types of materials that are used in spacesuits. So you can see them here, everything from polycarbonates to um, Teflon, coated Teflon, all of these are in little patches and um, perseverance can watch these patches and measure the, how they're degrading in this radiation environment. So we're gonna learn whether our spacesuits will even keep our astronauts protected from things like, oh, the, the lack of an atmosphere on Mars or the very little atmosphere that's there. It's like I said, about 1% of Earth's. Um, this is of course, Perseverance taking a look of like high little helicopter and Chris will tell you about the helicopter here in just a little bit, but let me tell you what Percy's been doing. So now that you know what uh, Curiosity did in the first 10 years. Well, Perseverance landed and then was uh, they planned a route to have it go over here to get to the Delta. So let's take a look and see how close to that plan did they actually get? Well, pretty good. First, it took a detour, went, went the opposite direction at first because they saw some interesting um, terrains, sort of three different trains that came together and they thought, well, let's go hightail it over there and take a quick look first. Then they reversed, drove all the way around very quickly and finally, um, Perseverance is indeed exploring the Delta. This is a picture of the Delta material that's there. Um, uh, you know, a beautiful, beautiful panorama, um, just 
it, it, this of course has been changed in colors to look like it would look on earth. They've modified the colors such that our eyes would see the colors these rocks would have on earth. It would be much pinker in the Martian, um, the true colors you'd get on Mars, a little bit more like this. Um, this is the first sample site of delta material. So that's a sedimentary rock that it drilled into and it, uh, it actually managed to pick up material of a rock. So you're seeing there material that was in a sedimentary rock that was laid down over time in that delta. The delta might have the history of life on, in Mars in it. Maybe there's chemicals there that the signature says, this life made this stuff, we, we don't know. Um, Perseverance itself does not have the ability to look at that hole that was made, although this is before they made the hole, I think, or maybe right after. It doesn't have the ability to go in there and make these measurements. You need a very big lab to get it in the details we need. So it's taking these samples and storing them. And the idea is you store it for the future and send it back to Earth, and then you make these measurements in an Earth lab. Now, this is the sample before it was drilled out. And you notice there's a weird pattern there. There's three holes that were put in there by the laser. They shot it with the laser three times that give us the orientation that that rock was before they drilled it out. So they can look at the main rock around it. They can look at the sample and say, this is the long side, this is the short side. Well, if you connect the dots, that makes an L. So there were a lot of people named, um, well, that had L names of various sorts that were excited to say that L stands for me. You just did some graffiti for me on Mars, Perseverance. Um, so anyhow, you can see these drill sites that are there and um, the samples that they're taking of, of this new Delta material. So it's very, very exciting. Now, what samples have been collected so far? 13 of the 38 sort of um, samples that they can do have been collected. And two of the five witness tubes, now what's the difference in those? I'm honestly not sure. So I'll have to look that up for you next time and bring it up. But um, one of them was actually atmospheric. So uh, that was the one I think that the stuff fell out or they, they made their first drill and they didn't get anything in there. So it just contains Martian atmosphere, but in a way that's kind of good. And uh, we'll step forward here and say the next one they did was a rock core. It ended up being an igneous rock, which means that it's lava. So this was a volcanic eruption. It wasn't sedimentary. It wasn't laid down by water over a long period of time or laid down by winds over a long period of time that could store life. Um, you tend not to find any fossils or, or evidence of life in igneous rocks, but this first one is igneous. The next one they took was an igneous rock as well. The next one they took was igneous. The next one they took, well, guess what, igneous. The next one was another igneous rock. Are you starting to see the pattern here? Um, the next one was an, a volcanic igneous rock core. Um, and why are they taking all these igneous rocks? Well, they wanna characterize the environment of where it is. So it's, it's exploring this Delta region. Yes, this used to be um, all of it we think was underwater, but at the same time, lava flows came through here and they changed what was there. So we need to understand those lava flows in order to dis, you know, disentangle what might be a sample that could contain life from the other types of lava rocks that are around. So indeed, the next one was igneous as well, another igneous sample, oh wait, a sedimentary sample. So this was swift run, as they called it, and it was a rock car core at Skinner Ridge, but this, whether this was delta material or whether this was laid down by winds, we're not really sure, because this, I don't think it's up on the delta. Um, I don't think that was the first Delta sample. The next one was also sedimentary. So exciting that this is a sedimentary rock. And then finally, another one sedimentary on Wildcat Ridge, another one there on Wildcat Ridge. And I think it's that last one on Wildcat Ridge that are the, the first true Delta samples. And you can see here, um, 10, 11, 12, and 13, I think are all probably gonna be considered Delta samples, by the way, the last four. So. I misspoke earlier. Anyway, this is the location of all the samples that it's taken so far, but these samples have to get back to Earth somehow. So we're gonna need a sample return mission. And you can see sort of the general idea. We have a helicopter to help scout what's gonna be going on. We have perseverance there to be able to hold on to the samples and deliver them to the lander. And then that rocket that's coming up there will have to blast off. It's a two-stage rocket that the samples will be loaded into and it'll head back to Earth. Now, Earth is not that big in the Martian sky. It's a little tiny blue star, but anyway, you get the idea. So where's it gonna land? Well, here looks pretty good. 
Perseverance has been scouting for a good landing spot. The idea is let's have it be free of big rocks, free of things that could be bad to land on. Um, and indeed, this looks pretty darn good. These are some, some little tiny rocks here, then it's pretty broad. So if we can target this and land with any sort of accuracy with our lander here, Perseverance could get back over there and deliver the samples to be loaded onto that rocket and take them off. And they have begun working on the rocket itself. You can see right here, um, they're testing it. So there it comes down and crashes into the, the metal structure there and the legs went down to kind of cushion it. But they're working on the lander already and this whole thing will hopefully bring the samples back to, back to Earth sometime in the 2030s. So we have a little while to wait to get them here, but that is the plan to actually eventually land and make it all the way back. So Chris, I think it's time for you to tell us a little bit about what's been going on. Um, I'm seeing flight log here. Sorry, I fast forwarded on you, but what's what's been going on with our helicopter? Well, uh, I love spacecraft, but I also love aircraft. I'm a big aviation enthusiast, so I'm very interested in what's going on with Ingenuity, that is both a space probe and our first powered aircraft on another world. Uh, the main theme here for all of you Ingenuity fans is reassurance, because we have had lots of flights, 29 of them to date, covering seven kilometers. This is far, far beyond the original mission they'd intended. But in July, we didn't have any flights. And some people were wondering if there was a problem. No, there isn't. Um, although it's solar powered and there was a little bit of dust on its solar power panels, uh, Ingenuity is just fine. Uh, they are, however, delaying a little bit. They delayed through July. They've been waiting until, well, basically right now, August is when they're planning to start flying Ingenuity again. So I just wanted to reassure you that it, it is very much in operation. Um, the uh, flights, you see some of those just recently, critical point to notice, we're not just doing demonstration flights up and down anymore with the helicopter. This is an operational mission where it's a full partner to Perseverance, and if you see, it says airfield and then has a letter and then airfield and it's a different letter, that doesn't mean they're connecting through, you know, Atlanta or something like that. These are flat patches of ground, like David was talking about, that are safe to land at. And they are hopscotching from one to another to another, moving forward and scouting terrain ahead of Perseverance. That's going to continue. I mentioned dust. Uh, Martian dust season is in the northern winter and the southern summer for Mars, and that is the conditions right now at Jezero Crater. It's northern winter. So they were delaying a little bit to just have the air clear out a little bit, be a little bit less dusty. So if you are a fan of this aircraft as much as I am, don't worry, she'll be back in action very soon. We're waiting for NASA to announce a date. Now, the dust is a thing, and it can be a big concern. It's a much bigger concern for the second mission I'm going to talk about, which is the InSight lander. The InSight lander, here's a picture of it, um, it has this strange little thing that looks like, you know, a colander set down on the surface. Um, this is a seismic sensor. The InSight mission was not sent to study what it could find on Mars, but what it could find in Mars. It was our first detailed attempt to understand the insides of the red planet. That's why it's a lander and not a rover. It did not need to rove around. What it needed to do was put the seismic sensor on the surface, like a physician's stethoscope, hold it in place, and listen for Mars quakes. Did they find any? Oh, yes, they did. It's been a very successful mission, and we've gone well over the original span of time that was planned for the mission, but that dust. The dust is a problem because this is a solar-powered mission. If you look at a picture here, you can see the solar power, uh, solar panels on the, the spacecraft sitting on the surface. Well, that's when we landed, and this is what they look like today. It's a problem. It's down to 10% power, and they basically are going to have to stop listening for quakes and just stop operating the mission. Now, like I say, that's okay. It's been a nice, long, successful mission, and they have 
through the uh, sensor on the surface detected a lot of quakes, more than 300 quakes, some of them pretty sizable. Uh, here's a, an example of uh, the spike in energy as Mars shakes a little bit from some activity inside it. Few of the quakes were actually as powerful as magnitude five for us Californians. That's almost enough to get out of bed for. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these uh, seem to be occurring in the same place on Mars, the vicinity of Cerberus Fossi, an area of volcanic features that might still be active. Something's shaken up there. Uh, so uh, the InSight mission has been a big success. They are in December going to stop actively working with it. But who knows, maybe a, a windstorm will come through and it'll clear the solar power panels and the spacecraft will wake up. NASA will continue to listen to see if the uh, spacecraft can work in the future. But right now, InSight has to be a mission that goes down in the books as a big success. And that's my part of the report on doings on Mars, David. Well, let me make sure I'm not muted again. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, that rockin' report, that the Mars shaking report there. Um, a five, a magnitude five earthquake is actually not super small. I was surprised when um, when it measured one of those, and of course, it was right near the end of this mission. So, um, I hope we send more more seismic equipment to Mars. I think it'd be good. Well, there are some big results. They found out that Mars had a molten core. We thought yeah. it did. We didn't know. It's a big successful mission. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Now, if we could get that core moving again a little bit, we might be able to get a bigger magnetic field, but that's a that's a whole other problem. We're not gonna drill that deeply anytime near, near the future. Um, now, th these aren't the only craft that are on the surface of Mars. This really was sort of a Mars surface report. Um, the Chinese sent a lander called Zhurong, I think is how it's pronounced. I, my Chinese isn't so great, but nonetheless, um, that mission, well, took this cute selfie. It dropped off the selfie camera, backed up, and took a picture. And that's actually a pretty big rover. Those solar panels are really large. When you see pictures of people standing next to it, it's not a little, little, tiny, tiny um, rover, which is, which is interesting. So, um, the, you know, the data here indicate that uh, both liquid water was present where where Zhurong is, and that. Uh, it, that it was on the surface for a long time, so that they're hydrated minerals, even where Zhurong landed. So not a lot has been published. There's been some studies, um, but nonetheless, they're being somewhat secretive about what it's doing. But some of the data that have been gathered have started to show up in journal articles. So um, stay tuned for more from Zhurong. We're, we're you know, little by little piecing together what that mission has been doing. But their space agency has not been, you know, posting it to websites and just going crazy with it. They're letting their researchers uh, do the research and do the science on it. And then they're writing them up and publishing them in journals. And people in our uh, YouTube chat are saying, Jared, now, Jared, we're going to have to make sure you always just go completely last. And then that way people will have to stay tuned for Jared. But indeed, it is now time. For, for Jared to join us. So I'm gonna turn over control to you. Do you have the guacamole running or do you need me to run it? I sure do have some guacamole and uh, let me tell you, I love me some guacamole. So okay, we'll break out the chips, everybody. It's time for some fun with Jared Head. Yeah. And thank you all for being patient. Yeah, with thank it. you. And I guess I'm the roller coaster at the back of the theme park here tonight. So, cause we're gonna be well, talking. Almost, there is one story after you still. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm, I'm second to last. Okay, so I'm, yeah. I'm almost the e-ticket ride. Uh, with that there. So excellent stuff. Well, uh, very exciting month that we just had a whole bunch of things occurring in this past month as well. So why don't we just get started? Because I mean, there is just so much to have to cover. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Bepi Colombo zipping past Mercury. It's on June 23rd, the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission, which is on its way to Mercury, took its second flyby using these flybys to slow itself down to get into uh, Mercury orbit 
in December of 2025. Really difficult. I love that they took these two engineering cameras and patched them together so you get this sort of amazing view of Bepi Colombo on its way outbound from Mercury right there. Mercury in an absolutely stunning place. It's like our moon, but a little bit bigger and a whole lot hotter. So very much looking forward to that. It's going to do an, about an 18 month mission. It's actually two orbiters, one from Japan, one from Europe, and both have different missions. One from Japan will be looking at the magnetic field, and then the one from Europe will be doing basically a in-depth study about just about everything that it can at Mercury. And of course, we also had Capstone. Want to update that, our, our little spacecraft that NASA launched on a Rocket Lab Electron to the moon. Unfortunately, right after it separated from its Hypercurie upper stage, on July 5th, they lost comms with it, and there was a bit of fretting over that, and there was a bit of hair pulling, and then eventually, the next day, they were able to reestablish communications with it. They think it was a software error that actually caused this, but this spacecraft, which is uh, roughly about a six-unit CubeSat, so if you can imagine, about a 30 inches by 30 inches in size, so uh, not not particularly, or excuse me, 30 centimeters uh, in size there. Not particularly big uh, with that, uh, but it's going to be doing this very interesting test of something called a air rectilinear halo orbit. So this is a special orbit around the moon that will actually allow a vehicle such as the upcoming Lunar Gateway Station, where we're going to have astronauts stationed at, uh, to keep in constant communication with the Earth. So this orbit actually doesn't go on the far side of the moon at all. It sort of stays over the poles uh, and keeps it in constant contact with the Earth. So really looking forward to the results from that. And then on July 1st, United Launch Alliance fired up a nice Atlas V 541, so a nice big five-meter fairing with four solid motors and a Centaur upper stage with one engine, sending up United States Space Force Mission 12, which is the wide field of view testbed. This is developed new instrumentation for missile and counter space threat satellites that are upcoming to be put into orbit, so maybe a little bit of infrared action there. And then shortly after that, we had Virgin Orbit launching straight up using their Launcher 1 rocket. Now, that right there is the 747 that carries Launcher 1 underneath its wing called Cosmic Girl. This was the first night launch of Launcher 1, and it carried seven CubeSats for the United States Space Force and two... CubeSats for NASA, and I always love this little uh, bit they show at some point during the flights because this is a whole bunch of data, and if you're like me, you love data, so I love seeing uh, little mission pages uh, like this. Also, of note, straight up, that name being a Paula Abdul song. So for those of you who are into uh, late 80s pop, looks like they're getting a little recognition for you there. And Falcon 9, of course, at SpaceX continuing to send it through July, just absolutely demolishing its, <laughs> its, its uh, build out of its Starlink constellation and a whole multitude of other things. So five Starlink launches in July and then one cargo launch on July 15th to the International Space Station, which we'll talk about in just a little bit later on this. I do want to point out one thing, which is that some of the Starlink flights from Vandenberg had a lot of fog, and it wasn't done this time. But in the past, there have been some very interesting things that uh, SpaceX has put on their broadcast. So this was one from Vandenberg, excuse me, Vandenberg. Uh, there, as you can see, there is a great image of the Falcon 9 sitting on the pad. And there was this nice little graphic that came up one time, and it says, live pad views, Falcon 9 is vertical, promise. So I guess we had to take their word for that. But there was something that we did see from SpaceX that was a little bit of a surprise. And attention on the net, we have a launch abort. This was the first launch abort from a SpaceX flight during what is called the terminal count, or basically coming down in those final minutes to the actual count uh, of the rocket lifting off. First one in 18 months. Last one, you can go back uh, towards December 2020, so very long time uh, for that to go back. Now, also, we had a debut of a rocket this past month, and that was Ariane Space's Vega C. So a uprated version of their Vega Quatre, launch vehicle. Trois, and we love a little deux, rumble in the jungle un, here. Top. Allumage P120. 
et décollage. And this launch vehicle is bigger with enhanced stages. And that first stage there is actually a P120 solid stage. And it's going to be shared with the upcoming Ariane 6. Uh, Ariane Space will be flying next year. And this is a cost-saving choice and to share that design there. And SpaceX had their... Commercial Resupply Services 25 mission. This is Dragon C-208 making its third trip to the International Space Station. And this is Booster 1067 making its fifth flight and its fifth successful landing on a drone ship out into the Atlantic. I love this shot here of it just above orbital sunset there. And, uh, oh man, is that orbital sunrise? It's uh, Well, it's at a good time for lighting. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and then, of course, the classic view that we have all become accustomed to of these, <laughs> these launches from SpaceX and the beautiful landings that we have. Uh, Dragon was carrying about 2,600 kilograms of cargo, including EMIT, which is going to be an instrument that studies dust distribution in the Earth's atmosphere and combats climate change. There's a battery discharge unit to replace a failing one out on the truss of the International Space Station. And also, take a look at this. If that isn't something straight out of 2001 A Space Odyssey, I don't know what is. That is an absolutely gorgeous shot of Dragon on approach. And of course, a bit of time lapse there uh, in order to get it there. It doesn't actually move that fast, but that's not time lapse. It really does dock that nice and easy. Uh, there were also two new extravehicular mobility units on board, uh, what most of us would call a NASA spacesuit. And it will return an old suit, which had a water leak. And this just kind of demonstrates how nice it is to have a cargo craft with what we call down capability or basically the ability to return cargo and other things from space and then we also have oops let's go ahead and go through this here right back up we have our test of flight support booster 2 Whoosh. Ah, nothing like a solid motor and this is testing out a new system to gimbal the nozzles on the Space Launch System's shuttle-derived solid rocket boosters that will be used for the Block 2 Space Launch System, which will be a little bit later down the line. This is testing a new system that does not use hydraulics to move the nozzle. It actually uses an electrical system for that. And then going to China, we had the Wentian module launching on a Long March 5, which is currently China's largest rocket. It eventually rendezvoused with Tiangong, which is China's space station, and Wentian is a science module. It's going to be used to house experiments on board and help continue to do the research that the astronauts from China are currently doing on board. There is a three-person crew on board right now, and they were pretty thrilled to get a new module. There'll be a second module launching a little bit later this year, uh, supposedly, so we'll have to see if they keep with the schedule. And, of course, like we talked about with Zhurong earlier with uh, landing on Mars and all the data they do there, it's a little difficult sometimes to hear things from China. Now, we had something pretty amazing happen yesterday, which is that there were six launches planned to happen on August 4th. Uh, we had one from China, uh, one from Rocket Lab in New Zealand, one in, at the Cape uh, for the United States Space Force, a suborbital flight from Blue Origin, another launch from China, and then a launch of a Korean satellite to the moon by SpaceX. And there were six of them all lined up within 24 hours. Now, the previous 24-hour launch record was originally set on February 14th, in 1989. Um, there's been matched, of course, a couple times. There were two Soviets, uh, Soviet launches that day along with a United States GPS launch. But guess what happened? All six of them happened yesterday. So congratulations, everybody. August 4th, it is a new world record. The most orbital launches in one, as you can see right there, coordinated universal time day ever six Sh absolutely shattering that record and then of course we want to give you a little bit of an update about artemis one things are looking on track uh we're just seeing that the vab was opening up a little bit as they prepare uh to get ready to roll back out at some point very very soon uh, that window for its launch will occur on august 29th with the first window being 5 33 a.m to 7 33 a.m pacific daylight time and uh you know there are further windows in September, so if things don't work out so well on that first one, there's some extra time for them to figure out the problems and make it work. And then 
Just want to let you all know for your local Vandenberg Space Force base schedule with all launches with an orbital velocity through September of 2022. On August 12th at 2.30 p.m. local, 14.30, we've got a Starlink launch happening, Starlink 3-3 from a Falcon 9 from SpaceX that will be landing uh, its first stage out on a drone ship off the coast of Baja. So won't be coming back, but hey, still really cool to go look at it. And then on no earlier than August 27th, Firefly Alpha, is still working or Firefly Aerospace, excuse me, is still working on their Alpha uh, for their second mission called To the Black. You'll recall their first one had a spectacular and unfortunately, you know, two and a half minutes in the flight, had to activate that flight termination system and it went kaboom up in the sky. Uh, they got a lot of good data, so hopefully they're going to have an excellent second flight this time. In addition to that, we have NROL 91 at some time no earlier than September on a Delta IV Heavy. I highly recommend if you are in the LA area, drop everything, whatever day it is, and go watch that Delta IV Heavy, mostly because that is the last one that will be flying from Vandenberg Space Force Base. And it is the one of the larger rockets that the United States uses. And then no earlier than September 24th, a Falcon 9 will be <laughs> launching a weather satellite there. And I like how I put double Falcon 9s. Maybe Falcon 9 will be launching itself. We'll have to see a little bit later on with that there. So that is, you're out to launch for July of 2022. Well, thank you, Jared. You've pleased your fans. Um, <laughs> that. Um, although there is talk about uh, why we get to have you with a tie. And uh, TMRO d does not, so you, you may have to up your, uh, your your dressiness. And by the way, they also pointed out that you were stealing graphics from them. So I think we're in big trouble. Oh, no, we got permission. So if it was bad, I could have some people yell at me right now if need be. But permission. I think we're good. Sure we did. But anyway, no. Um, uh, again, Jared does, he does uh, Moonlight and other, other uh, shows. And uh, TMRO is one to check out. So folks, uh, uh, check out that that broad, those broadcasts too. If you enjoy what we do at All Space Considered, I'm sure you would enjoy what they do there. Uh, just more great space stuff. An awesome job tonight, Jared. Do greatly appreciate it. No time to turn to your questions and adulation uh, YouTube chat. We got to move on because we are already at the 935 mark. We're, we're going for one of our um, two hour shows tonight, I guess, or two and a half. Well, I don't know. I think we're already at the two hour mark, aren't we? Anyway, let's wrap this up with JWST Just Wow, which is why I called it the Just Wow Space Telescope. Um, before it launched, we were seeing uh, posts like this on social media. Do all fairy tales begin with once upon a time? No, many of them begin when JWST launches. Um, and yeah, I had to replace that those fonts there. It was impossible to read. Um, other folks were making wonderful Halloween costumes and dressing up as JWST before it launched. Others were saying um, James Webb launch coverage is a Christmas movie. Changed my mind, which is very funny because, of course, it launched on Christmas. Um, and then others folks were saying today the James Webb telescope switched on camera to acquire first image from deep space. Remove before flight um, as though they forgot to take the lens cap off. So there were some worries from folks that things wouldn't go right. Of course, things did deploy, deploy correctly, which led to memes like this one. Um, does it look familiar? Hmm, kind of seems familiar. Then we heard that report of an impact on the, the segments. And indeed, on the right-hand side, let me turn on my laser pointer here. You can see right here on this segment that impact spot. So boom, on the left-hand side, all the wave fronts are pretty well aligned. And on the right-hand side, there's that one little bit that the wave fronts are a little messed up. So luckily they can correct for that somewhat and it has not affected things too much. In fact, tis but a scratch for you uh, Monty Python Holy, and the Holy Grail uh, fans. Another meme that I really liked was uh, nice try NASA. Just saying that it looked uh, a lot like a, a countertop one of the sparkly countertops for those of you that are lucky enough to have them. Others were saying um, Hubble and then uh, JWST, the glasses on. That of course rapidly brought out this meme again with astronomers no longer so much interested in Hubble, but interested in JWST. Although really this was the way to properly make this meme with the actual images. Others took straight to the memes of let's decorate the first science images, which uh, is that the Philadelphia Flyers 
uh, I think so. I, I think it's a, a sports mascot from Philadelphia. Um, and then, of course, a, a cat in the nebula, or at least kind of has cat ears. I, I don't know. It's terrifying. Um, 4.6 billion light years away, we get this clarity, and 10 feet away in a security camera, it's just all blurry. Um, of course, folks made dresses out of this, and yes, that's an actual dress that you can buy. You can go out there, I'm not going to tell you where, but you can Google it and figure out where to get uh, web, web clothing. Um, higher redshift galaxies, astronomers, and tonight's archive listing. Um, you kind of need to be a research astronomer to really appreciate that one. So sorry about that, everybody. Archive is the listing for the preprint papers, the ones that have not been properly vetted. They haven't been um, read by all the referees and astronomers write the papers and they get a very excited and they post them there for everybody else to see. Back in my day to talk about like an old time astronomer, we used to wait until the referees had accepted the paper at least before we would load it onto the archive server. These days, people just see it as a free for all. They wanna beat other people, so they post it there right away. And then once it's accepted by the journal, oftentimes they'll, you'll see it get replaced by the journal version. So it gets updated to the final one. So right now, all these papers you're seeing or a, a lot of the results you're seeing are kind of first results. They're not really what the final say is on any of this. In fact, if you start seeing red shifts for these galaxies, um, Z is the red shift of the galaxy. It's how many times the light's been shifted to the red. So Z of 11 is, is really pretty darn far away. You're talking about, you know, 13 billion years ago, or I guess, yeah, red shift of 11 is about 13 billion years ago, a little more, 13.3, something like that. Um, and then you have 12, 13, 14, 16, 20. Somebody's claiming red shift of 20. Well, there are multiple papers for each of these objects. And well, one group might get a Z of 13, another gets a Z of eight. So don't really believe these numbers exactly. They all need to be verified. These are candidates. They're basing it upon the colors of these and where you get dropouts due to um, certain wavelength bands. But nonetheless, pretty exciting to see these numbers just being thrown around right and left. Um, it's kind of the, the, the wild west of, of redshifts right now with these galaxies, but pretty soon they'll turn on the spectrographs at our big ground-based telescopes. They'll analyze these in detail. Um, they'll use some of the other spectrographs on, on board our space telescopes, and we'll find out what the redshift of these objects really are, and where are they really back in time. Um, some more beautiful images have come out from the Webb telescope. Um, this is M74, and this is a Hubble image of it. And the Webb telescope gave us this, which is just crazy. And this is the, the near infrared camera. And the MIRI camera gave us this. Um, you can see this interesting bubbles that you find. There's a bubble there, there's a bubble there, there's a bubble there, um, there's a bubble over here. Well, those are actually probably caused by supernova explosions, clearing out the material and compressing it around them, which, which then triggers more star formation. So the fact that we're seeing this so clearly in this image is, is just spectacular. Um, the Cartwheel Galaxy is also another one um, that was imaged. Although, okay, this, this got misplaced a little bit, my bad, but we'll come back to that in a second. Another astronomer um, took an image of Proxima Centauri and said this was taken by JWST at this level of detail, a new world is revealed every day. Well, um, that, that's not a, a, a JWST image. That's a, a picture of chorizo. So <laughs> just took a, took a slice of chorizo and took a photo of it and posted it to social media. So don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, uh, Mr. Klein had, or Dr. Klein, I'm not sure he has his PhD yet, but he did apologize and said, I'm very sorry for, for teasing you all. Although to me, I look at that, that looks like a slice of chorizo. So I'm not, I'm not terribly surprised. Um, getting back to the image, this is a Hubble image of the Cartwheel Galaxy. And let me show you what the web image looks like of this galaxy. So here's the near infrared picture. So again, just the gorgeous dust that's there, an amazing structure and the two background galaxies there. And then going forward to the Miri image, the, the longer wavelengths. So just very, very cool. And this cartwheel was probably formed when one galaxy threw, flew through the middle uh, of this and sort of triggered that ring structure. Now, on top of all of this, uh, this is an exciting time for astronomy. Like we mentioned earlier, it was great talking to Dr. Ken Carpenter. And 
kids, kids and teachers have been inspired by this excitement. And this is sort of the, the good side of humanity, in my opinion. This is, this is what we do best. And by investing in things like JWST, which in the grand scheme of the federal budget was not that expensive, you'll see people complaining about the overall final cost, which sure was way over budget, but it's worth it. You know, we spend so much more money on destructive things, um, in things that are not so positive, and yet we can inspire the future generation to ponder and to think about and want to observe the universe and to explore further and to learn more. And that's really what we're doing here. So to me, it's not just the science that we're learning about, it's the inspiration that we're seeing with all these images. So that's what we're going to end on tonight. I do want to thank everybody once again. Um, thank you, Patrick, for all you do for us in the Sky Report. Thank you, Chris, for joining me with the Mars Report. Thank you, Jared, for your wonderful Out to Launch segment. And uh, if you do it again next month, we're putting you last. Um, and Katie, thank you for your pretty pictures and weather report. If you're still on here with us, feel free to pop in. And um, of course, we want to thank our whole team. There you are. We want to thank our whole team that makes All Space Considered possible. Um, you know, all our producers, all of our, um, our, our folks, just folks that do all the hard work to put these together. Um, and of course, Ken, there you are. You stayed with us this whole time. Um, that, that's amazing. We really, really appreciate you still being here with us. And, you know, we loved hearing all about JWST um, from, from somebody that works with space telescopes like you do. Um, having a real expert is, we're quite privileged to be able to have you with us. So thank you so much for that. Once again, uh, All Space Considered is brought to you by the City of Los Angeles, Department of Recreation and Parks. And um, we're also supported by Griffith Observatory Foundation. They make so much of what we do possible. We really appreciate all our members. And if you, you like this sort of thing we do, well, think about becoming a member. You can click on the link that's in the, the information for the video and think about joining the foundation. They get extra opportunities to hear more about space and science. And you can also support shows just like this one. So we appreciate all our members. Thanks everybody. Um, we'll see you again next month.